All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome tonight and thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Ray Hennessy and as always, I'm here with my co-host Scott. Good evening. A reminder that um, we do look forward to having you guys comment and ask questions as we talk. So please feel free to throw those in whenever and um, definitely please try to keep the questions on topic and we will do our best to answer them. Uh, tonight's topic is somewhat timely with spring on the way, even though right now in the Northeast it's snowing like crazy. Uh, but tonight we'll be discussing all things spring migration, what birds to expect, what methods we use to find them, and creating a rough plan for what you want to photograph during migration. Because Scott and I are from the Northeast uh, U.S., most of what we'll be talking about tonight is going to be kind of centered in that area, but a lot of the concepts should apply to wherever you live. Uh, so let's get started, and we'll begin with Scott telling us an overview of tonight's discussion. Yeah, so a couple of things we wanted to touch on is the timing of migration and what we look at. And really, it's about maximizing the time period. So I think Ray and I are both a little crazy sometimes about planning. So we'll take a look at that whole two-month period. And when we talk about the period, uh, we're really looking at April and May. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the timing and how to plan around that and a couple of tools that you can use um, if you're just getting started on this and you're trying to figure it out. I will tell you it took me about three to four years and, and most of you know I do pretty much just avian photography. So it took me about three to four years to figure out how to maximize this time period. The first year I was out, the second year I was out, it was really just hit and miss. I was all over the place looking for stuff, chasing, and I didn't really have a good idea or a good plan. Uh, last year, I really felt that in the late April, early May period, I, just, I, I really just maximized and got the most out of that time. Having good plans and good dates, even weather, you know, looking at different weather and where I wanted to be on certain days. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, we're also going to uh, look at a couple of tools, uh, internet tools, Facebook tools that you can utilize. And the way we're going to do it is I'm going to cover uh, songbirds since I get a lot more songbirds in Ray, and he's still struggling with that. So hopefully he'll pick up on how to do that One this year. One of these days, I'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's going to go through um, waders and shorebirds and talk about some of the uh, strategies he, he has for that. Ray lives in South Jersey, so he has really good access to the beaches. I live in eastern Pennsylvania um, in a really sweet spot. I, I get to the northern range of a lot of breeding warblers. And I also get to the southern range of a lot of breeding warblers. So I'm in a, a pretty nice pocket. And then there's a few species that I miss that, that just kind of travel over and they go all the way up to Canada. So we'll jump in with uh, timing. So when we look at migration, we're talking really about April through May. Once you get into late May, you're really looking at breeding birds. So I'm going to pull up. Um, you could probably see a, a portfolio here of yep. images. These are all images I took last year. And after a couple years, you start to learn what species are going to occur and when. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to talk about a topic. We're going to just show a lot of pictures. Everybody loves pictures. Feel free to comment on the pictures if you like them. If you don't, if you have a question about anything, we show yeah, you. Ask away, but one of the first war Yeah, one of the first warblers that, that I look for is these pine warblers. So I know that migration starts when I start hearing about pine warblers show up. In other parts of the country, you might hear about um, yellow-throated warblers, prothonotary warblers come up early. But pine warblers are one of those early migrants. Here's a uh, golden crowned kinglet. This is another kind of early migrant. This was from the first week in April last year. And then another one that's going to come up, not a warbler, uh, blue gray gnat catchers come up. One of the great things about this early set of birds is, and I wish I had the photo, um, Mark Stroll has the best blue gray gnat catcher I've ever seen. Yes, uh, the reason does. I wanted to mention that is you're going to get these in a sweet spot for budding trees so if you've got things like red buds in your area a lot of color a lot of purple and red you can then snag these early migrants on those so we've talked a little bit about um, backgrounds and, and optimizing backgrounds and seasons that's a great way to think about these early migrants um, you can also find some budding trees and hopefully get lucky on some of those a um, couple other pictures here just to show some of these early migrants this is a swamp sparrow that i captured last year this is a Louisiana water thrush, another early migrant, also a breeder in the mid-Atlantic. There's another one. Some eastern towhees. These will start coming up um, early April, middle of April. You'll start seeing these guys pop up. And then uh, toward the middle of the month, I start to look at really getting some more species. So I start to see um, in this area, you'll start to see black and white warblers. Here's another one. 
And in really good numbers, you'll start to see these guys, these yellow rump. They travel in big flocks. So sometimes if you can find a hot spot for them, it's a really good uh, opportunity because you'll have a lot of uh, subjects. Um, speaking of that, there, there's also, I'm, I'm going to touch in a minute on how to get some of those. Like, how do you find out if there's a lot of numbers somewhere? Uh, so we'll talk about some of the networks. There's uh, two more species I would just want to show you real quick that I got last year a little bit earlier in the season. This was toward the end of the month. So now we've got some oven birds coming up into this area. Love the stepping foot on and, that one. Yeah. Yeah, a little raised foot there. That's kind of why I picked this. Um, Ray's going to talk about culling images sometimes and what separates it. So I have about 40 pictures of this guy. Yeah. And that's the reason I picked this picture was just that little foot being raised up like that. Um, so that's an oven bird. When, when we look at where you are in the range, so earlier in the month, another way to maximize this is to go south. So those yep. birds, this oven bird, I might have got it in the end of April. If I want to run down and shoot with Josh in Washington area, Baltimore area, I might have been able to get him several weeks earlier. Yeah. So think about that as well. Um, and then you can also use a reverse strategy, which is to go a little further north. Um, if you're looking for the breeding birds that are going to be around in June. So some of these birds, if you're in, again, like D.C., Virginia, these birds are going to fly right over you during migration at the end of April. And they're going to land up in northern Pennsylvania, north New Jersey, maybe Connecticut, Maine, New Hampshire. And they're going to spend their summer there. So, um, you know, you can plan around that as well. And then one last bird, and this is a breeding bird, but um, they come up a little earlier than the rest. Um, and this is a cerulean warbler. And these were captured uh, last year, right about, uh, this is about 20 minutes from my house. So I'm really lucky to have a really nice spot of these black and white warblers, cerulean warblers, oven birds, And then Scott warblers. tells me he'll uh, come on up, get the cerulean, and he just never shows me. He always takes me somewhere else. I know it. <laughs> Ray's been up like three or four times for these. And the one time, like we're literally in the pouring rain. It's just raining. Horribly. And I'm like, Ray, yeah. they're, they're not coming out. And he's like, yeah, I'm coming up. We're going to get them. And, uh. Yeah, it never happens. Yeah. So uh, before I kick it over to Ray to get into some introduction on the shorebird part, I do want to just show um, the one of the tools. So the, the couple of tools that I would suggest is one, Facebook groups are great, whether they're regional groups. So I live in Pennsylvania, Lehigh Valley. We've got one called the Lehigh Valley Audubon Society. There's also a PA Birders website. Each state almost has at least one, if not several of these yeah. Facebook pages. So Normally, when somebody sees a bird, they start putting it up there. They get excited about spring migration. Hey, I just saw this. It was my first of year. Uh, if you're just getting started, FOI is going to be first of year when people type it out. Uh, you're going to see that a lot. Um, one of the things that I'll, I did in the beginning, and I don't do it as much anymore, but I would start to record those first of year sightings for me so that I knew the order that birds were coming. And it's very specific. Again, when you know the order that they're coming and you know the species, they're going to be in certain locations, and that's where you're going to want to hit. So yeah, I'll go back real quick to this um, this pine warbler that I had had kind of started the whole presentation with. But this pine warbler comes up the first couple weeks, and I know of a spot locally now where they're going to come every year. So rather, the first week of April, this is the spot I go to that first week. I go there every day, and I every day I'm off and I look for these little guys to be floating around and maybe there's some other migrants with them, but I know that that's a good spot. If I were to go up to Northern Pennsylvania, which is where I shoot some other warblers, the first week of April, it's probably gonna be a ghost town. So again, kind of tying in locations to species and knowing where to maximize your time. And that's gonna lead me into eBird. So eBird is one of those eBird, tools. Scott, uh, Edwin asks, yep. A uh, quick question about getting photos of warblers and small birds in low light wooded areas. How do I get clean images in low light? He's been struggling with that lately. Um, so there's two things I would say. Uh, number one, every camera is going to handle that differently. So, you know, um, higher end full frame cameras are definitely going to be better in low light. Uh, obviously having faster lenses, it can also help. So equipment is one thing that can actually certainly make a difference. Uh, but then secondly, I want to mention is go with slower shutter speeds than you think you can get away with, you know? Uh, it definitely takes some practice starting to use those, but Scott and I will routinely shoot these warblers in the low light scenarios down to, you know, 200th of a second, 250th of a second, which doesn't sound like much when these little things are bouncing all over. 
and when they are actually bouncing all over and moving, we definitely get motion blur, but when they're sitting there perched or holding still in that split second between when they're jumping from one branch to another, you can definitely get sharp photos in those, those little bits. Uh, do you have any other tips on that, Scott? Yeah, so I actually have a couple um, photos flagged to talk about okay, later. Perfect. So I, I prom yeah, I promise we'll address this later too, but there's two schools of thought in low light and there's no right or wrong, it's personal preference. So Kurum did a, a talk last week and talked about flash on oh, songbirds. Yes, yeah. And I know Josh uses some flash in low light situations and there's tons of photographers that do it. So that'll that's one way to do it and that'll certainly work. If you're doing the second way, which is lower your shutter speed down to one two hundredth, one one hundredth even, um, there's a couple things that are gonna happen. One is you're gonna miss a lot of shots because you're gonna get motion blur, yeah. it's just inevitable. But the second thing is if your frame rate is higher, you're going to light them up with a lot of frames. And in that sequence, hopefully you'll shoot. If you're shooting eight to 10 frames a second, one or two of those you're going to find are really, really sharp. So I have some examples later where I shot down at like one one hundredth and one oh. two hundredth of a second. And you'll see the photos are sharp and there's no motion blur, but it's not going to be every frame. So you're going to lose pictures because of that that um that motion blur and that that lower setting i noticed a huge difference though um when i went from 5.6 aperture down to f4 aperture and that's sure, just an investment of speed, money yeah. Yep. yeah it's just an investment of money most of us are shooting crop sensors if you're shooting full frame it's not going to be a huge problem i would say with canon and icon crops most people are going to tell you 800 to 1,000 ISO, you're gonna start to get disappointed if you get above that. So I go up to 1,600, but once I get above 1,600 on a D500, it's not something I'm really looking to share. Whereas I'll be happy pushing my camera up to like 6,400 and uh, getting usable images out of that. So, you know, it's yep. equipment and personal preference. So yeah, we'll hit that a little bit more, yep. but thanks for that question. So back to eBird. Yep, and and again, I've seen uh, comments from Josh yep. and Kurum. So again, there is no right or wrong way. I will tell you the flash will, will take some time to play around with um, and the results are gonna be probably more consistent because when you're using flash, you're probably gonna get a lot more keepers. You can't use necessarily the fast frame rate. So there's a, a give and take. As always. Um, and, then, and then it just depends on what you like. So if you shoot some with flash and some without, see what you like and, um, and then go from there. So when we look at eBird, this is probably the biggest tool under this explore bar. I'm not going to do a tutorial on this. I promise most of us have used this. Yeah. Um, explore a hotspot is a big popular one. Um, that just tells you if there's places near you, you can pop in there maybe the night before you shoot, see what's being seen in that area. If you're targeting a specific species, you can use this species map, type in the species, see what's going on, change date range. It's a great way to find a specific species. Uh, the one I wanted to talk about today is not as as used are these bar charts so when you go into the bar charts, you're just going to pick your state um so here i i like to do by county and i'm going to pick uh my county which is lehigh and all it does is pull up every species reported in that county historically yeah. in your county so i i know i want to do warblers so i'm going to come down to the warblers and then you get to see the pattern of migration and what comes in now this doesn't give you all the details but it does kind of give you an idea just on this initial bar chart so if i take a couple days off in april and i want to shoot you, you know maybe this northern perula looks interesting this palm warbler looks really interesting yeah, Pine warblers. early yep yep because they're they're showing me just on this pie chart and I'm, I'm not i'm not a birder i'm not talking to anybody but i know already that these two species are coming earlier and then you can go ahead and click on them and you can kind of see what the frequency is. So what are the ranges of dates? And there's all kinds of stats that they track. Um, eBird is is by far the biggest collection of data yeah, for birding. Very so, data rich. Yeah, really, really great. Um, and then you can also pull up other counties. So this one is for a county north of me. And when I compare, I'm gonna go to Lehigh County real quick. Um, when you compare the two counties, you'll see some other differences. So for example, here's a Magnolia Warbler. I don't know if you can follow my mouth. And when I look in Lehigh, I don't see a lot of information on Magnolia warblers in June and July, which means they're probably not a lot of breeding birds. Yep. Now I just flipped over and I'm now on to the Luzerne County, which is a little north of me. And I'm gonna try to find that same one, Magnolia. Where are you? 
and I think it's here. It's got to be there somewhere. There it is. And if you look now, June and July, I don't know if you can see the highlights, packed with breeding warblers. So I know if this is a target bird for me, uh, driving an hour north is going to pay off. And if I stay here and just keep my fingers crossed for magnolia warblers, it might be a little bit harder. So again, I can pull up the data and you can see everything that's happening there. So that's the eBird way to, to kind of use the bar charts. And then hopefully you've already used the explore the hotspot and the species maps. So those are just some quick touch points I wanted to go on. I'm going to kick it back to Ray and he's going to go over a couple things that he had. And then I'll come back and I'm going to cover some breeding birds which migrate and then they kind of stay up here for the summer and how I approach those. Yeah, so you'll probably start to notice a trend here in every one of these talks. Every, th every single time we're talking about, no matter what the approach is here and what the topic is, it all, a lot of this comes down to knowing your species. So learning the habits of them, in this case, the migration, the timeline that they arrive and where they may go, and then starting to learn about the habitat of them. Uh, so where they like to hang out, where they like to feed, where they like to breed and nest and those sort of things. So, you know, uh, years of doing this for us has helped with our knowledge, but also there's tons of books and resources out there online that can really help you out to learn these things. But the key is that I, I want to kind of make this point and just drive it home is learn your target, you know, uh, and that is going to pay off uh, in dividends. Uh, so shorebird timing, um, uh, kind of the same exact thing Scott was talking about. Uh, different species are going to show up at different times of year, um, but shorebirds are definitely a little bit more compact uh, the period of time when they all arrive. Um, pretty much all of the shorebirds along the New Jersey coast kind of uh, hit at the ballpark the same time. Uh, there definitely may be different peaks in different times of, uh, uh, you know, a couple different weeks or whatever, but um, different species might have a different peak. But generally speaking, if you go down the shore, you're going to hit a lot of these. And, and most of these shorebirds were all taken in the same, sometimes even the same trip, and you just can get a wide variety of them. Uh, so with the shorebirds, you know, it's really about you know, finding the right habitat. And in this case, most of the time along the New Jersey coast anyway, it's gonna be on the beach. So hitting the beach and spending a lot of time down there is definitely gonna be uh, the number one go-to with all these shorebirds. Uh, beaches and uh, marshes definitely uh, can help. And the nice thing that you'll notice about these, this is a sanderling uh, as well as this last one. In spring, you're gonna get some very different looking birds than you will any other time of year. So the sanderlings that are running around right now, because some of them still hang around here in the winter, are almost all white and slightly gray. They're just really light birds. But then these males in the breeding plumage just have this awesome, you know, rusty browns and everything like that. So they look very different and they're definitely sporting their uh, best looks this time of year. So uh, keying in on them during spring migration is definitely a great time to get them looking their best, at least in my opinion. Uh, and yeah, Scott Kemper just on the um, comments just mentioned horseshoe crab mating season is great for shorebirds. Yeah, a lot of these shorebirds, especially some of the ones I'm going to right here. Here we go. Perfect example. The red knots. They actually time their migration to the first full moon of May, I believe it is. Uh, in this case, and it's right around the first week of May anyway. Uh, and this, this year, I think coming up, it's actually going to be... Um, the last day in April is the, the full moon that time of year. Uh, in any case, the horseshoe crabs come up out of the bays and lay their eggs, and all of these shorebirds come by to feast on them like crazy. So you can see their bills right here just covered in sand, and actually some of those things are horseshoe crab eggs. Uh, and that's what actually fills them up, gives them the, the food that they need to make it the rest of their way to the trip up into the you know, northern parts of Canada and the Arctic to go ahead and do their breeding. Um, so these red knots like this, the, the peak of them is going to be about a week period of time. So knowing that period of time and knowing where to go on these sandy beaches along the Delaware Bay is key to being able to find them and photograph them properly. Uh, and then you start to get into the same thing with even these shorebirds. You know, you get these different birds that start to breed and nest around here. Here's an osprey uh, coming into its nest box in the morning. And, um, you know, having the knowledge of where these guys nest and what time of year they nest and same thing american oyster catchers they actually nest so you know you're going to catch them during the migration as they're coming up but they're going to end their journey a lot of them right around new jersey area which is convenient for me so i actually get to 
uh, you know, photograph them a little bit later into the season. So even though I might catch them in the beginning of their migration uh, earlier in the April and May, uh, I can still see them in June and sometimes into July uh, to photograph them. And then uh, the other thing with a lot of these shorebirds is when they're nesting up in these areas in New Jersey along the coast, they, uh, these, these tall waders like this end up hanging out at rookery. So this, these were all taken at the Ocean City, New Jersey rookery. Um, it's at the visitor center on the Ninth Street Bridge as you're going in. If you've never been, it's an amazing place to see and photograph all of those uh, wading birds. And um, you can kind of get to see them. I'll just hop back here real quick. You can kind of get to see them eye level as they're coming in. The trees are below. And I think I have some others from that area. Here we go. There's another one, a great egret. So they actually have their nests up in these trees and you can see them and photograph them um, right there. So, you know, you can get down there early during spring migration when they're first coming up and they're starting to build their nests and you'll start to see them flying in. Here's before everything actually changed to the green summer colors, but they're starting to build their nests, these, uh, these birds. So, uh, you know, understanding that timing with all of these shorebirds can be definitely helpful. And, um, you know, it's kind of easy with the shorebirds, the, the ones I'm talking about. It's one area you go to. You head to the shore, you know, so there's not too much uh, research you got to do with that other than learning the kind of different habitats that these different birds, so like these black skimmers are always going to be right on the actual ocean usually, uh, right on those sandy beaches trying to set up, and they, they usually kind of form colonies, so they'll be hanging out in large groups, large numbers. Um, so I'm just going to flip through a couple of these different wading birds and show you guys so here's a laughing gull this was early in the season scott will remember this day it was probably one of the dirtiest grossest days we've ever had um it was absolutely disgusting <laughs> we were in the delaware bay and we started out where we were just going to kind of wade yeah we'll just wait a, a little bit at, like knee deep and and next thing you know and a half hour later we're just laying down and crawling through this sloppy mess and just just nasty stuff just trying to get the shots we wanted and i came away with that really nice one so i like that um all kinds of different hair and wading species all start to show up and do their thing. So uh, lots of variety in the area, especially in the Northeast. And, um, you know, spending a lot of time down the shore can definitely put you on a lot of these birds and give you lots of different opportunities. Um, again, w I would say with, these, with shorebirds versus the warblers that we're talking about today, morning or afternoon doesn't make much of a difference. Uh, the shorebirds, oddly enough, they seem to be pretty active all the time. I, I still like to shoot in the morning because generally speaking, there's less people out there, but uh, this was a shot that was taken in the evening. Um, so uh, there's definitely, I think, less importance of going out in the morning versus the evening with all these shorebirds and the wading birds. They kind of are active all day and will be feeding all day. So I would say if you're not a morning person, shorebirds are a great kind of general species to target. Uh, here's one taken right smack in the middle of the day. This was like high noon, um, taken down the shore at uh, Island Beach State Park on the bay side. Um, so uh, I think there's definitely opportunities for doing thing, photographing these kind of birds in the middle of the day and later in the day, especially if it's an overcast day. Um, and then, um, Scott, were you going to mention about kind of targeting different species in different light or not really on this one? Yeah, I can go through. I have a couple examples. Um, but I think the, one of the concepts that Ray, when he talks about different species and different lights, and I know we mentioned this on at least one other call, was just if Ray and I were going to shoot together, um, and we shoot together in the migration probably like maybe once every week or once every two weeks. Yeah. And so we'll kind of coordinate and say, hey, what's your schedule? And we'll pick a day. And then it's almost like we have two destinations. So yep. destination one is if the sun is going to be nice um, during golden hour, we're going to go do shorebirds. That's exactly what and I was going to mention. And again, a lot yeah. of these, yeah, a lot of these species overlap. So I may, I may have some of these nice warblers coming through in my area at the same time that we're getting some good shorebirds yeah. down at the shore. So if we're going to shoot golden hour, warblers look great in golden hour, but so does everything else. But shorebirds do not, to me, look as nice in overcast light. Correct. Whereas warblers, um, because there's so much color in them naturally, they'll tend to really pop even on an overcast day and you can shoot them all day. Warblers are a lot tougher to find. Yes. So if you know a good um, wader spot, for example, if you show up at sunrise, they're, they fly they're in and out there. of the same spots. <laughs> yeah, they're gonna be there. Yeah. So they're easy to find. 
Um, sometimes if you're going to look for warblers during migration, I've gone to spots like my little hot spots that I have. And one day I get, you know, five species, six species photographed and I feel good about it. I go to the same spot the next day. There's nothing. Yep. So warblers during migration can be really hit and miss. And part of that's because they migrate overnight and they travel in large flocks and wherever that flock Very drops weather dependent. and they're mixed. Yeah, they're, they're, they may drop. Uh, in one lake one day and then the next day they might drop in in a mountain and there's going to be a few scattered in between but when you hit those nice big flocks or sometimes they'll call like a, a fallout um, that you can get a lot of times right during a rainstorm or right before a big storm comes in um, those flocks will just fly out of the sky and drop in early morning and and you'll I mean it's amazing I've been haven't been in a massive fallout like I've heard stories about but even small ones where you get a flock of 30, 40 birds at the exact same time, different species all around you. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, so before I hand it back to you completely, I just want to hit one more way of, you know, kind of researching your migration and finding out what's going to happen when. And uh, if, if any of you guys use Lightroom like I do, uh, there's a great way you just hit the metadata filter up here and then choose date on the left. And then you can actually start to see the exact dates when you photograph things. So here's this past year, uh, May 2nd, May 17th. So you can see I photographed all these different shorebirds, um, semi-palmated plover, a uh, sanderling, black-bellied plover, red knot, and oyster catcher, all on the same day. And it gives me the exact date. And then I also have them kind of uh, pinned on a map here. So if I click on that, this is where I took it, so it'll just kind of remind me of exactly where I was, and I'll just zoom out here, and you guys can see that was Stone Harbor Point, so that's where I took that specific photo. So using uh, your own history of photos that you've taken, and you can see I can just scroll back in the past years here and see all the different dates when I photographed a lot of these different things, and you know I can just use them to kind of have my own built-in sort of database of when different things were photographed and tie that in with the eBird stuff and the Facebook communities. And then you'll have a really good idea of how you can approach your upcoming year. So back to you, Scott. Yep. And make friends and make friends with birders there. Most of the people on the call are going to be uh, geared at photography. Yeah, Just don't go out um, and photograph I, things with them. Cause that won't work out. Yeah. I have, I, I think I have like a little bit of a birding community that I'm friends with. And then I have the photography community. Um, if you're really respectful and people value you as a photographer, um, the birders have their own little sub cult and locations. And um, I had a guy say to me the other day, you know, I, I never share locations, but I'll tell you this one because you're different than the other photographers. Yeah. I don't know what he meant by that, but I think he meant that. He I meant you're really weird. Anybody. I know that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you get into a network of birders or even just a couple friends that are birders, they'll put you onto some really neat spots. And a lot of times especially for songbirds, you might get some good breeding locations that you didn't know about or that aren't on eBay or eBay on eBird or um, that <laughs> or other eBay. people are talking about. Yeah. yeah or eBay. <laughs> All right. So a couple, uh, I'll go through now. I'm going to kind of switch gears. These are breeding birds. Um, one of the things that I love about warbler photography and songbirds in general is the diversity that you get. So last yeah. year, I think I photographed 32 different warbler species, which I was really excited about. But each species is a little bit different, not just in plumage, but also things like um, location and habitat, the colors that typically surround them. So here's some prairie warblers that breed up here. Um, one of the things that's neat about these prairie warblers is the, the habitat is much different than some of the others. So they prefer open ranges, um, not nearly as dense. So you can get them out in the open. You can photograph them lower, so they'll come down to perches that are, you know, a couple feet off the ground. Yeah, they're like which I like and because stuff, shrubbery, yeah. Yeah, and there's some species that are definitely like that. Prairie warblers are one of them. Again, when, the better you know your species, yep. you might be better prepared with how you're going to approach that or day. Even where so to hooded look. warbler. Yep. The this is a hooded warbler, and I've got a couple. Uh, these two birds are similar in terms of habitat. They both breed in the same area. Um, these I get along the mountain. One of the things that I've mentioned it before, I'll keep mentioning it when I'm photographing in the mountain, the thing that I look for is elevation. So these birds are coming up into the tops of the trees or the middle of the trees, and I'm already there. So I'm not shooting from underneath. So I want to uh, this is just a migrate. real quick there. Uh, yeah, sure. I'm the Southern New Jersey guy. A lot of these same warblers will migrate through this area. I almost 
don't spend any time trying to photograph them down here because it is flat, flat, flat. And exactly what Scott was just talking about with elevation. So just because these warblers come through my area and eBird might tell you, you know, there's really high numbers during this particular week every year. So it's a great place to go. And while that's great for birders and to see these birds, to photograph them is very different. So I'll go to these places and I'll see a ton of species and they're all up in the top of the trees. And all I'm doing is photographing their butts from underneath of them. So, um, you know, really understanding where a good photography place is for these warblers versus a good place to just view them also starts to come into play. And that's what Scott was just talking about, about using elevation. Yep. Yeah. And uh, blue wing, this is a blue wing warbler. This is a warbler that you can get lower. So, again, knowing the species, this one will come down. Um, here's another hooded warbler. And this, I like to shoot from elevation. They tend, for me anyway, I, I tend to get them uh, in the mountain areas or a little denser wood. One of the things I hope that, that, that comes through in these pictures is when I photograph warblers, I don't use a lot of setup perches. And that's fine um, if you do. Um, I, I actually do, so I'm not going to say I've never done it. Um, and there's no problem with it. Sometimes I would like to do it more. But I also like the sense that the bird is in its habitat. So here you see a, a hooded warbler that kind of feels like what a hooded warbler should be. Um, this is even a better example. This is a northern water, water thrush. These are a little bit tougher to get in this area for me. And one of the things I liked about this, you can actually see some drops of water in the trees and he's partially obscured. These are skulky birds. They, they like to be low and thick vegetation. So when I'm showing a northern water thrush, I, for me, I'm not going to show it on a nice clean perch with an empty background. I kind of want a feeling that it's a little covered and there's some bre some leaves and you see some uh, foreground blur on it, which a lot of times is not ideal for bird photography. But in this case, I kind of like, well, that's that's the bird. So let's show it the way it's supposed to be. Uh, real um, quick, a, quest another a question came sure. in. Sorry to interrupt. Um, Miguel asked for about shorebirds and low angle photography. When getting low and in the mud and sand, would I recommend a rain suit? And if so, which brand? Um, I do not wear anything waterproof. Usually these birds are being photographed in warm enough weather where, uh, you know, we just get sloppy and messy. Scott was with me on this day photographing the sanderling I'm showing you right now, uh, all these birds right here. And as you can see how it's really wet right there, the waves were just kind of washing up and, and rolling right on me at, during while I was taking these photos and I just kind of commit to, I'm going to get soaking wet and messy. And if it's cold out, I'm going to get cold. That's kind of just part of what comes with it. So, um, I'm sure there are things you could do to, you know, protect yourself and stay drier. But, uh, you know, usually with the way we're laying on the ground, you'd need a full on, you know, head to toe suit to stay dry. Cause the water's going to get in somewhere. And, uh, you know, just worrying more about staying clean and dry, uh, it kind of takes away from the photography for me. So I just kind of understand that I'm going to get wet and messy and dirty and bring a change of clothes and then just kind of go with that. So sorry, but back to you, Scott. Yeah. And I'll just add on to that. I, I shot, uh, I was out in Utah shooting with a couple people and, um, we had this really, I mean, amazing situation where this Harrier came down. It was on roadkill that was off to the side of the road. And we were able to just get right up on the bird. And the first thing I did, they jumped out of their car. They start shooting pictures. The first thing I did was slid on my, I have these pants that I wear because there was snow on the ground. Uh, the brand is Frog Togs, but they're just cheap things you pull over. I take those things with me everywhere I go because even if I'm in a pair of jeans and I wasn't expecting to shoot, if my camera's in the car, I really don't want to get, I don't want to drive an hour home in a pair of jeans that's soaked. So I yeah, always keep a done. pair of these. Yeah, I, I've seen you do it. <laughs> um, I always keep them in the car and I have the same thing like a jacket that's just a waterproof jacket. If you lay in water long enough, it does seep through. But if, if you're laying in like wet mud or sand for a little while, it, it's ideal. So I would just suggest keeping something in your car all the time. Um, I do the so same. in those moments. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Have a and then have a change brand, of clothes. So, yeah. Yeah. I have a, a little thing in my trunk. It's, you know, like a little Rubbermaid container. And in the summer, I have a set of gear that's in there all the time. And in the winter, I have a set of gear that's in there all the time, just yep. in case I need to change. So um, tell yeah, us so about this a, beautiful golden wing warbler, Scott. Yeah, so this is a pretty rare warbler. It took me a while to find them. These are very, uh, first of all, it's a, it's a tough bird in terms of numbers. So yeah. their habitat's really decimated. Um, they're doing some programs in Pennsylvania to restore habitat for birds like this. So 
the numbers hopefully will stabilize, but this was a real treat. It's not my best picture, but it's just a great opportunity to get a bird that is a, is a tougher bird to get. Um, and again, on a pretty clean perch, these chestnut sided warblers breed up here. I remember that day. Uh, they're pretty easy. There's another golden wing. Um, and again, these are all birds that are pretty low. So these are a little more open habitat birds. So when you look at this uh, chestnut, you can see both of them are kind of on these clean perches with not a lot of um, habitat around them or a lot of leaves. They're, they show like that in, uh, on, on their breeding areas. So that's kind of a typical yeah, um, photo for me. Yeah, now here's one. This is a perch that I, I won't say I set up, but I kind of did. Uh, there wasn't a lot of perches around. They had trimmed the area that I like to photograph. Somebody came through. It's a hawk watch. So they cut down all the branches so they could view the hawks better. So there wasn't a lot of perches. So I just stuck a few in the ground um, just based off of what was available. So I probably should have picked a prettier perch. Uh, this is a worm-eating warbler, but this is one that I did stick a perch in the ground just to have something there um, if they came up to land on. Yeah, but I want to mention one thing you did mention. You said you grabbed those sticks from what was around. So, you know, I think that's the key. If you are going to set up perches, which I've certainly done myself, um, definitely use something that's nearby. You know, don't bring in some oddball perch from some other location entirely and place it in because then it's just going to kind of, I think it's just going to come across as fake and set up. Yeah. Um, these are prothonotary warblers, and this one is a pretty good example. I think I, sh I remember shooting these early in the morning in low light. Okay, so this is an example of sh a slower shutter speed. This was a 250th of a second and ISO 2000, which, on, again, on, for my D500, that's pushing it. I like to keep it under 1600. I really like to keep it under 1000. But it looks great. So I'm sure I – yeah, I put a little bit of noise reduction on here, I'm sure. Um, but it was close enough that I didn't have to crop. If I had to crop this with that m amount of noise, it probably would, wouldn't be very good. Um, so that's the prothonotary uh, warbler. These are swampy birds, so they're probably you're not going to get them in a lot of daylight. So you're going to yeah. need need a flash, or you're going to shoot them with a slower a slower shutter and a higher ISO. And this one was at one two hundredth of a second. So again, you can shoot songbirds with a slower shutter. Uh, actually, the next one is one one hundred and twenty fifth. That's hard to say. Yeah. One one hundred and twenty fifth of a second. So that's a white eyed vireo. Uh, again, he was he was like right on top of me, and ISO was a little over a thousand on that one. Uh, and then I'll just run through some pictures. Um, oops, let me get on the right screen. Here we go. There's another white eyed vireo. Nice. White eyed vireo. These were all taken the same day. Uh, this is a black billed cuckoo. I got a couple of these, um, so I'll show you all three. Gorgeous birds. Yeah, this one is really neat because you never see the their tail. tails. Yeah. Yeah. So I like um, – so these are birds that aren't normally showing themselves, and this was the typical look we got that day. But it came on to that perch, um, and then we got the tail. So that was pretty neat. I was with Mark when we shot this one, and it, it was probably – I think it was the highlight of Mark's spring because he, he still says he wants to go back and get it again this hey, year. Do you mind hanging on this one for a second? So were you sure. in a vehicle or out of the vehicle while you were shooting this? Uh, this one, I'm I'm out of a vehicle. Okay. Uh, the prothonotaries, all of those are lower birds, so you don't yeah. need to be at elevation for the swampy type birds. Are typically going to be a little bit lower. Well, here's what I want to point out to you guys. Uh, notice in this composition on this uh, black-billed cuckoo, the uh, those leaves in the foreground on the left, right there. Um, I'm guessing because I know Scott and I shoot with him often, and he shoots kind of similar to me. He was probably on a monopod. Um, yep. and, uh, you know, that's something that allows you to do these minor movements with these forest birds like this. So countless times, uh, you know, a, a leaf, a single branch or something like that will be in the way. And I think we both have found that having a monopod allows you to do really quick, fast adjustments. And they're usually subtle, you know, like literally leaning, you know, three inches to the right or a foot to the left or, uh, lowering the camera down and that doesn't even require adjusting anything you just kind of lean forward and tilt the camera down um, so making these minor adjustments allows you to frame up something like this and clear the tail there whereas uh, you know shooting on a tripod which many people do could be somewhat more cumbersome to do that with so uh, I, I love shooting with a monopod I definitely recommend it I totally get shooting on a tripod so uh, I just wanted to throw that out there for anybody that's thinking about what support system do I need or what should I try? And I think monopods are really great for these kind of foresty situations. 
Yeah, if I think if you were in a breeding ground where you know they're going to be in a in a very limited area, you can you could probably get away with a tripod during the earlier migration when they're literally just moving through. You have to think about the, what those birds are doing. They're trying to get to a destination, so they're not going to be in one area. If you catch them, they're probably just flown a long way. Um, during migration, they've landed. They're looking to feed early in the morning to refuel because they fly overnight and they're going to be bouncing around. So if you're on a tripod, it's going to be a real challenge. Um, so if you do use a tripod, consider during the migration part or if you're in a migration area that it might be a, a good idea to at least try a monopod. And again, if you're slower shutter speed, that hand holding is going to be a problem because you're going to want to get some stability. Um, so a, a monopod does give you something. So we are going to do an equipment talk later. Um, I don't know what Mark is saying now in the in the yeah. comments, <laughs> but uh, he's wanna... Mark's a tripod guy. I've yeah. been trying to convert him for the last year. Uh, I think we've been hounding on him for a while. Yeah. I gave him a cheap one to try, so maybe he'll use it one day. Uh, Shirley asks, she always thought that we should not use a flash uh, shooting birds. Flash may she asked, does flash hurt their eyes or scare them away? Uh, Shirley, I'm not 100 percent positive, but I think some studies have been done that. Uh, using a minor uh, flash at a, you know, a decent distance does zero harm to their eyes. I think it's kind of similar to what it would do to our eyes. So, you know, it might just obviously get your attention really quick, but um, it's, uh, I don't think it's going to really uh, harm their eyes from some of the studies I've seen. But again, like, don't, don't take that as 100% true. Uh, that's just what I've heard. And yeah, and Ray, she might also be referencing owls at night, which is a different situation. It's a and very different. Situation. Again, I'm not a yeah. scientist or an ornithologist, but yeah. if you if if we're at night, just people, your pupils dilate. They're much it's bigger. Much they're more, more sensitive to light. Yeah. Yep. And these birds that we're talking about, the flash is really just to Mostly add a little fill, um, fill yep. or to to lighten them a little bit. So, so their eyes are already in the daylight. So yeah. I don't. I don't think it's an issue, but yeah, and, and not a, the, not a, the few times I've done songbirds at a feeder, I've had some birds and I've just been firing away with a flash at a, you know, again, just during daylight and everything. And uh, they don't even seem to care. So, uh, from, from what I know from other uh, photographers that do use the flash, it's not like every time they fire a flash, the bird immediately leaves. So I think it's uh, pretty much a non-issue. Yep. Uh, just a couple more birds. This is a Canada warbler. Uh, this is one that, again, it's it's kind of in a thicker vegetation, lower elevation. You don't need to be shooting high. You can shoot flat areas with this kind of species. Uh, this is a dick sissel, which is really hard to get in Pennsylvania anymore. Unfortunately, there's there's just not a lot around. It's a great and, example um, of this was, speed. Yep. And I was going to say, this is one of those. I think I was at one one hundredth of a second. This is in the rain. Um, I saw him making runs, so he was going out to a field, but because of the rain, he kept coming under this one tree to the same branch or set of branches. And I thought, wow, this would be kind of cool. I, I was hoping to get him shaking his body off and see what that would look like and maybe some rain flying off or maybe the head would be sharp and I'd get lucky. But I knew if I put the shutter speed too high, I wouldn't get any motion blur. And then the ISO would just go through the roof and it wouldn't look good. So I tried a slower shutter speed. And with the frame rate, mine is 10 frames a second. I just I just lit them up and hoped that I would get something in those frames that I liked. So you could see the motion blur on the tail, but the head at one one hundredth is still pretty sharp. And if you zoom in on it, you know, it's it's as sharp as you would shoot at one one thousandth. So yeah, and I think it, it makes can the photo more interesting. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I'll just breeze through a couple more. This common yellow throat. There's a yellow throated warbler. This is a tough one. Uh, this is a chat that um, used to be in the warbler family. They just uh, I guess put it into a different classification now, but it, it was a tough bird for us to get. Um, it took me a while. It took me three years to, to photograph that bird. So that was yeah, nice. These are breeders. These are low breeders. So again, you, you can just, you can walk through a trail and find these common yellow throats pretty regularly. Uh, these are lower breeders as well. That's that prairie warbler. Uh, Canada, these breed low, so they're pretty easy to photograph. This was a hard oh, nice. one for me this year. Yeah, Kentucky warbler. Uh, the first one I photographed ever, and I was really happy to find this one. And this is a good example of um, location and research. I wanted this, I, I really wanted Kentucky Warblers, and I just kept on looking. I didn't ask anybody with a location. I didn't go through a network. Um, honestly, I, I'm very private about location. So if somebody after this call asked me where to find this Kentucky Warbler, I'm not going to tell you. He doesn't because, tell me, guys, so it's not yeah. personal. <laughs> I, I'm just I'm just like that. I'm just goofy about um, like kind of they're they're hard. There's not many in this area, Pennsylvania, for sure. 
Um, so I just kind of get protective about them. It's understandable but, um, when you've are, this, worked for years to get a location. Yeah. You don't want to just give it away to anybody asking. So yeah. understandable. And I, yeah, me and Ray have talked about that before. Some of the other people I've talked about that before. You know, if it took me five years to find this bird and somebody walks up to me and says, hey, can I go shoot that? I'm kind of like, well, <laughs> you just started shooting last month and it took me five years to find this bird. Yeah. So I guess it depends how good of a friend you are at that point. Yeah, um, exactly. So what else you got yeah. here? And then there's there's a couple more uh, that I'll just kind of whiz through. These are black throated greens inbreeding. So this these were up north. So when I talked earlier about shooting some birds down south. These I found locally, but very hard to get. As soon as I went up north about an hour, I photographed, these all three were from the same day and three different birds. They, they were in this one spot, they were everywhere. So knowing that if you want a certain species and you go to a certain area um, during those breeding them. months, yeah. June, yeah, you're gonna get them. Uh, Scarlet Tanager was taken up there. And then this is kind of like the Kentucky, this was the, my first morning warbler. I had to drive two hours north to get this. They're very hard to get in Pennsylvania. Um, and I was stoked to find it. And again, it was a, a lot of research, e-birding and kind of looking and I, not no lie. I just, I saw some other people taking pictures of birds and I just, I just kept investigating. I stalked one person's Facebook page and I figured out where it was nice. and that's it. And that's my last one. So uh, Pete um, asked, what's can... your uh, must have warbler this season, Scott? A bay-breasted warbler, which Ooh, is nice. a migrating, so they don't breed anywhere around here. So to get it, you have to get it during migration. I get them coming southbound in fall, but they have a much different, like extremely different color. So when they're headed north, yeah. um, they're crazy colors. And when they come back south, they look really muted. Yep. So I've gotten them photographed, but only in fall. So I'm looking for a spring bay-breasted warbler this year. All right, cool. So any other specific points you want to make? I'll do a, a little bit of an overview wrap up on this. Yeah, um, just a couple things. One, I, I do I do want to give a lot of recognition to some of the, the people that I'm seeing on the call. But, you know, we wanted to get Josh. We're doing a, a talk with Josh, I think maybe next or soon. Yeah. Um, he did a trip to the Falklands. So I know we're going to do a question and answer, yeah, but he's that. a great resource for this. I did see a question come up about flash in the eyes. So uh, since neither Ray and I do, well, Ray, I guess, shoots flash for his weddings. But if Kurum or Josh or anybody that's good with flash photography for birds wants to answer that question earlier. I did earlier, type a comment. I, I responded by typing did you? a oh, comment. Okay. But yeah, basically just okay, get the sure. flash as far away from the camera as you can. So uh, getting that flash up on a bracket or elevated above the camera will help uh, reduce some of that really bright eye kind of silvery eye flash you'll get the equivalent of what humans would give a red eye birds are going to give just kind of like a really bright white silvery look uh, so just getting that flash away from the plane of the lens uh, definitely helps with that okay super and uh yeah scott did you want to do the uh the fun uh photo competition at the end of this oh yeah all right so cool. ray we were trying to do something at the end of each call if we have time and we we have about five ten minutes so um I challenged Ray to a, a migration off, which means that somebody types in a species. Since he's got Lightroom, he'll find it real quick. Yeah. But he has to pull out his best species, and I have to try to find my best. And we're gonna see. We're gonna let you guys we'll vote. Let you guys see what you like better. So on who's on who's better. So if you if you want to go ahead, you could put in the um. In you the could put in a there. species, whether it's a warbler or a songbird or even a waiter. Uh, and we'll see if I, first of all, we'll see if I can find it. Cause my archiving <laughs> system is pretty non-existent, so that'll be um, good but one, hopefully, yeah. hopefully I could find one and then Ray will pull his up like in two seconds with his keyword right, search. So our first request is outside of our range. Edwin asked for a snail kite. Uh, I don't think Scott has any of them. The one photo nope. I have is pretty crappy. So we're going to skip that. So let's try to stick with, if possible, somewhat Northeast, uh, or, you know, along the East coast, uh, migrant species, since that's the talk today. Uh, we'll try and keep it kind of uh, centered towards that. So Pete throws out a uh, white-eyed Vireo, and I can pretty okay. much tell you Scott's going to win that one right now. Uh, let, me, <laughs> let me see what I got. I don't even know if I have any good. Yeah, I got a good blue-eyed. Yeah, my best white eye is pretty rough. So there's my best yeah. white-eyed Vireo. Um, so we'll wait and see what Scott has here. Yeah, I would say, let me drag it over here. You had some earlier. That's my yeah, favorite. There you go. So. Yeah, we don't. I don't even think we need to let the the group vote on this one, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, if you guys want to let us know, we sh you should see both of them up on the screen shortly, uh, or right now, actually, I should say. Um, and yeah, if you guys want to let us know which one you like, and then we'll kind of move on to some of the next ones because we have a few in the list here. Uh, so and as see. people are yeah, and if you want to ask questions as we're going through, yeah, please do. Um, please do. Yeah, type in the questions as well, and we'll try to see if we can find. So, oh boy, blue-headed Vireo. You going for blue-headed Vireo? All right, there's yeah. mine. I got mine up already. There. Jeez, I, man, you kill me with this. Again, not great, but uh, I don't uh, know what I, you have, so I might have a chance on this one. Yeah. All right, take a question and let me see if I can find a blue-headed right. Vireo. <laughs> uh, a couple people got to run, so thanks for joining everybody that's got to leave. Um, let's see. Emily mentions when I use a flash, she dials down the flash power about two stops, then uses a flash extender, a better beamer or such, uh, and has a separate arm to attach the tripod or attach to the tripod gimbal head to separate the flash from the camera. So um, if she wants it on camera, she'll point it up and make sure it's not pointed straight at it. So yeah, that's a great point, Emily, just getting that flash off the camera. So uh, now we got blue-headed Vireos up on the uh, screens here. So let us know in the comments which one, which one you guys like the best here. Um, I don't know that there's a clear winner here, so I'd be kind of curious to see if we can get some votes in on this one. And I know we're on yeah, a I bit will... of a delay, so we'll have to it... wait. Yeah, it's a good comparison too because yeah. um, I've, I've heard people say like I, I had one guy unfollow me because he doesn't like my style of photography being um, like like he doesn't like portrait photography for birds, which I just don't get. I think yeah. birds are beautiful. If you could show the detail, show them. I totally want to show birds in the environment as well. I want to make them big in the frame. I want to make them small in the frame. Um, but I would say if you, it's a good comparison of style, you're going to see when you see my pictures, they tend to be more uh, tightly cropped or closer. And part of that is because of the lens. Um, we both use the same lens, but Ray shoots a full frame and I shoot a crop sensor. So in essence, I'm a little bit closer. Um, but it's also just a, a preference. You know, it's just kind of what I like. So there's no right and wrong. But it is a, it is an interest. Anytime we do this with species, almost inevitably, my bird is a tighter portrait yeah. and Ray's is an environmental <laughs> shot. All right. Next one up, we got black-throated blue. Uh, I can tell you right now, Scott's going to go ahead and win on that one. <laughs> uh, I might get this one. Hold on. Let me see. I don't even know. Yeah, I did get one last year. Uh, and here, when Scott brings his image up, you'll see his is even his is kind of in more environmental for him, but it'll still be closer than mine because uh, I'm pretty sure I know the one he's going to bring up, or at least that's the one I would. Bring uh, up. And, and we got. Uh, let's see. Wait, on, we, what are we doing? Black throated blue. One? Oh, okay. Uh, on that last one, we got one vote for me. Both are great, so that's a 50-50. And then two, one, two, three for Scott. So Scott won the Vireo one. All and right. no hard have, feelings, guys. Yeah. I have two black-throated. That's the one I thought I you were I have two black-throated blues. This is the smaller one, but I also have a super, super close, yeah. tight shot, All right, too. hey, pick one. Pick one for the voting here, Scott. Which one are you oh, going with? <laughs> You sticking with yeah, that all one? All right, I'm gonna. Uh, I think I'm gonna go with that one. All right, all right, guys. So we'll leave these up on the screen for a little bit here. Uh, let's see what you guys got. Let's see what you like there. And there is a little bit of a delay, so we're gonna just let it sit here, and then we'll kind of move on to the next one because we do have a couple of few ones in here, and this is fun. Um, all right, Black Bernie in next. Let's see what Ooh. we got here. Did you get Black Bernie in this year? I did. All uh, right. So, yeah, here's what Scott was talking about. I'll show you on my screen. Here's actually uh, uh, this one was taken in the fall. That's more of a Scott style photo. Definitely in your face and close. Uh, and this is a little bit more of what I would kind of normally shoot. And this is actually uh, this was kind of a late spring. Uh, so this was actually a breeding bird. Um, and that's kind of my favorite of that one. All right. So that's your black Bernie. Yeah. All right. My black nice Bernie one, is up. Scott has one. So so now we both kind of know the habitat of these birds and what Scott's actually shows is a little bit more accurate habitat of what they're found on, uh, on a hemlock there. Uh, they definitely kind of are found and, and can be more visible in those versus the kind of open perch I have there uh, in my shop. But in any case, you guys can uh, definitely get a little bit of uh, an idea of some different looks there. 
Um, let's see what we got on that last one. We got Scott, Scott, Ray, Ray, Scott. My sister votes for you, Scott. That's real nice. Uh, Ray. <laughs> if your sister votes for me, I automatically. Yeah, win. I think that's how it works right there because I think it's split. <laughs> so that's definitely going to be the, uh, the the tip there. <laughs> Uh, what about um? A couple so, people somebody giving... had a black-bellied plover. Yeah, let's let's hit so the let's short do a, Let's here. do a waiter. Yeah, you know, what? and we were both uh, shooting this same bird, so this will be interesting. I'm gonna go with yeah. the the fun pose that I had there. Where's your Scott? All right. See, I, I win finding it every time. So. Yeah, it's not a speed contest. I don't know if you could see the little crab he's got in his bill. Oh, nice, nice. That's a yeah. good one. All right, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what you guys like on this one. Um, surprisingly, I actually, I think, might have the closer photo there, so that kind of reversed the roles just a little bit there. Uh, and we're getting some really good comments on this stuff now, so uh, thanks, guys. This is a lot of fun. Oh, I even got a vote for the black-throated blue. That's kind of surprising. Um, I know there was a couple of other ones up there that were really good. I'm just trying to scroll back and find them. They're too early. Look, we're getting so many comments, I can't. I can't scroll back that far. But yeah, I think I saw something. Those are nice black throated uh, or black bellied plovers there. So, um, yeah, I think these are the same. I think I shared three from that day. I think it's this yeah. one, this one, and this one. But that one I think is my favorite. The lights, real, I, I like their lights. All right, here we one. go. I got this. So let's, let's wrap this up here. I'll pick one species, then you pick one species. So I'm going to go with pine warbler. <laughs> how, how are you gonna pick your best photo <laughs> all right you got some good right, pines fine, man dude. you got some real good pines so all right do do pine more and you'll be able to throw it right back at me next because you get to pick <laughs> all right hold on let me find a pine warbler uh all right i was I'll just kind of doing this one. for fun because i actually had this pine warbler photographed on a pine cone uh Pete, who's actually uh, on the thread here, was actually with me when we photographed this. So we actually set up this perch. This is definitely a setup perch, but it seemed <laughs> That's obvious. not even yeah. fair. <laughs> First of all, I vote for you on this one. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, so now you pick. What do you got? What can you... Uh... Um, uh, do, uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you a chance on a, a waiter. Let's do a uh, snowy egret. Ooh, snowy egret. All right. Uh, see, Scott's much nicer. I picked one where I obviously knew I was going to win, uh, but Scott's. This kind is a. Ch I think this is a fair challenge because yeah. I know you've got some some good ones. Yeah, you're definitely Bang. gonna. Yeah. All right, there we go. Let's see. I want to see the vote on this one because I think they're they're wildly different looks here, um, and. Uh, uh I'd like the voters to note that mine is in breeding plumage. It certainly is, yes, and I'd like the voters to know that I managed to pull this shot out of full noon sun in the middle of the summer so uh, this is a late late season one um and it was in the middle of the noon scott was with me in the beginning of this one but then then he had to leave <laughs> uh, josh is asking for an american bittern do you even have one of them scott i don't know uh no i just have a documentation <laughs> shot mark mark comments race catalog is hilariously faster <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Scott's I don't even have a catalog. I just search through Flickr and type in and hope it comes up. My sister's voting for you again and then apologizing for being a bad sister. <laughs> All right, <laughs> so we got, let's see, what do we have here? We got keys for the win. Um, Scott, nice plumage. Scott, Scott, Ray's too close to call. Scott, hard to pick. Scott, Ray, Ray for the action. Uh, how do you compete with that? Dan mentions <laughs> uh, Ray late day at Sedges. Oh, she knows she knows where I took that one. Scott on the egret. Scott, I think you got it on that one. So nicely done. All right. Yeah, you gave me a fair chance, and you still pulled ahead. So uh, nicely done there. Guys. <laughs> that was fun. All right, cool. So um, just a quick overview for everybody. So during migration, lots of planning. Uh, spend some time doing your research. Learn the species. Um, definitely. Uh, you know, talk to different people, uh, birding friends, use the eBird websites, um, you know, try and actually make a plan. Uh, and, you know, number one, just get out there and have fun. Enjoy being outside in the spring when everything's starting to come back to life and all these new great birds are coming in. Uh, anything else you want to add, Scott? 
No, uh, I just thought that, you know, I hope it's a good topic and I hope uh, people got some stuff out of this. Feel free to message um, most of your Facebook friends with both of us, but yep. feel free to send to either one of us a message. Um, and I will tell you kind of in our, our group, uh, Kurum, Josh, uh, Mark, Great uh, Tyler guys. Reber is also kind of part of that. But we're all very um, good in, in terms of wanting to help other people learn photography. And that's kind of why we do this. So if you have any questions, feel free to send us a private message. Um, and we'll make sure you get that we get back to you on that. And I think, Ray, do you have the next topic already? Is that are we up to Josh? I think we're going to try and do Josh next. I'm just not sure exactly when that's going to happen. So uh, if that's not going to happen soon enough, we'll try and sneak in one other topic in between then. But I, I would say definitely within the next two weeks, we're going to have another talk. And hopefully that will be us interviewing Josh Galicki about his trip to the Falklands. Um, so that's going to be a really special one. I think it's going to be fun and definitely worth tuning into. Uh, so thanks you everyone for taking the time uh, to spend and listening to us. And we really enjoyed all the comments. This was a lot of fun. And hopefully we have you guys back again next time. So have a great night. Thanks again. All right, guys. Thanks.